Good afternoon. It is Monday, May the 1st, and I call this meeting of the Clear Creek Independent School District Board of Trustees to order at 4.31 p.m. Let the record show that a quorum of board members is present and that this meeting has been duly called and that its notice has been posted in accordance with Texas Open Meetings Act, Texas Government Code Chapter 551. We have a quorum of four members. Um, so at this time, at 432, the board will now move to close session as authorized by Texas Open Meetings Act, Texas Government Code Section 551.001 concerning purposes permitted by the act, including 551.071, consultation with attorney, 551.072, deliberation regarding real property, 551.074, deliberate the appointment, employment, evaluation, reassignments, duties, discipline, or dismissal of a public employee, or to hear a complaint or charge against an employee. Mr. President. Mr. Uh, Bowen. Before, before we do that, uh, can I recommend that we do that at the end of the meeting, uh, just because we have guests here to present to us, uh, so they could get their presentation done first, and then we could go into closed session at the end of the workshop? I think, I think we shouldn't take that much time in in closed session it should be it should be quick but um and that'll yeah okay yeah just throwing it out there i i, I gotcha but yeah okay. so at at this time we'll just roll into closed session
And I call the board back into open session at 4.43. And seeing no community input, we will go directly to uh, item number five. Um, do I have a motion? Yes, Mr. President. Ms. Jekka. Um, I'd like to move to take, accept this recommendation of the superintendent to approve Claire Poe as high school principal. Thank you for that motion, Ms. Cheka. Do I have a second? I'll second. Thank you, Mr. Cottrell. Seeing no further comment, I'll call for a vote. All in favor, please raise your hand. And motion carries unanimously. Next, we'll move on to item six. Um, oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Yeah, I just wanted to thank y'all for that. And um, Ms. Poe has been a, a science teacher at Clear Creek High School, assistant principal at Clear Falls High School for four years and associate principal at Clear Falls High School for five. She's very familiar with the, with the community and has a tremendous amount of support. And now we need to find a good associate principal. So we'll start working again on that. So we're very excited. Thank you. Nice. Thank you. And congratulations to Ms. Poe. Mm -hmm. And next we'll move on to item six. Do I have a motion? Mr. President, Mr. Bowen, uh, I move that we adopt the uh, or we approve this uh, the superintendent's recommendation to adopt the human resources report listed in the agenda. Thank you for that motion, Mr. Bowen. I'll second. Thank you for that second, Mr. Larson. Seeing no further comment, I'll call for a vote. All in favor, please raise your hand. And that carries unanimously. Next, we will move on to item seven, um, a presentation by our facility advisory committee. Yes, and on behalf of our district, I'd like to thank our facility advisory committee co-chairs. And today we have Monique <laughs> Bailey and RJ Buckman here to share with us. Um, Bill Steinhoff is not here, but he is also, we have three co-chairs. Um, their professionalism and dedication to this important work has been um, just outstanding. We are so grateful for that. We could not ask for better leadership. So I'm going to turn this over to our co-chairs at this time. Thank you. Good afternoon, Mr. President, distinguished members of the board. My name is R.J. Boatman. I have the honor of serving as a co-chair for the CCISD Facilities Advisory Committee. I would like to start by introducing my co-chair, Monique Bailey. And next, I would like to express our enthusiasm and excitement for the work that we have seen. The knowledge, passion, and commitment of Dr. Engel and her team is both awesome and inspiring. From our perspective, their meticulous research, planning, and conscientious approach to ensuring the total health, safety, and academic success of CCISD is unparalleled. During this process, I have been reminded of the work of Dr. Eric Jensen on Environments for Learning, and Dr. Engel and her team have literally checked every box. I look forward to our future project completion and the associated recognition of being one of the most innovative and accomplished districts in the country. To that end, I would like to turn the presentation over to Ms. Bailey and Dr. Engel for a brief overview of the project thus far. Like to get out of the 
Athletic Facility Advisory Committee. It's a pleasure to be before you. This is my first time uh, volunteering in the district, and I've definitely been amazed at what we can come together and do. Uh oh, uh oh, I went too far. Sorry, y'all. Don't blink. <laughs> All right, <laughs> committee charges. The Facility Advisory Committee will make recommendations to the Board of Trustees concerning the timing, funding, and priority of capital projects over the next three to five years. And then we've been touring facilities, reviewing facility assessment information developed by the district staff, the engineers, the architects. We are set to prioritize the district facility and capital equipment needs for the next three to five years. That's definitely been enlightening. Um, consider recommendations for the Vision 2030 design team. We are understanding the district's enrollment trends and projections over the next 10 years as they relate to facility usage. We also seek to protect the general fund and to minimize the district's reliance on the capital and contingency reserve fund to meet long-range capital needs. We analyze property value trends and property tax rate implications of a potential bond election and we consider constructive public feedback. All right, the committee members are as listed, um, beginning with our first name in alphabetical order. Our meeting dates, we started out in the Educational Support Center, and then we've been going all around from Hall Elementary, Green, Clear Lake, Ed White is set for tomorrow, and so each new visit enlightens us in a new way. I think this is the part where we sing karaoke, is that? No. <laughs> <laughs> That's fine, okay, no problem. <laughs> okay, well, one of the other things that I was happy to learn was about how well they could simplify the fact that we have two buckets. We have funds generated mainly by local taxes and state funding, which is our general fund. Those cover the costs associated with daily operations, teacher salaries, utilities, fuel supplies, et cetera. And then the other fund is our capital project fund, which are funds generated by the bond proposition that we're working on, approved by the local voters of CCISD. Those pay for the capital needs, such as land, building, buses, technology, priority repairs, et cetera. As far as infrastructure replacement, we look at existing facility and building components with the defined life cycles, and they had provided us with ample documentation of what those proposed should be. There were some lively discussions about how our freezes might impact the life cycles and the warranties, so it was very, I found it very constructive. Um, you'll see the different categories, building envelope, civil, electrical, food service, life safety and security, mechanical, plumbing, technology, building system. As far as priority repairs and replacement, replacements, we have the existing facility and campus needs, including the life cycle replacements that I referenced, condition and programmatic items. These categories, architectural, athletics, transportation, furniture, fixtures, equipment, technology devices as well. What we learned on campus tours. Um, for those of you that were at the last meeting, I was very impressed at how it was organized so that we visited Green first, which is in need of, of repairs and upgrades, and then we visited Hall. And what I was able to come back to the committee and say is that Green, when you take a school like Green and give them proper resources, you end up with me. I grew up in an area that didn't have necessary resources, but when I was put in the right environment with innovative teachers, now I'm a mom of four, multiple degrees, four degrees to be exact, and so it was inspiring for me because I know that the potential is sitting there, but even the best seeds can only grow best in the best soil. So that's what we're trying to provide. So now I will pass it to the next person in line. Oh, okay. Dr. Green. Dr. Ingram? Yes, that's what I thought. Okay. All right, and I'll just, I'm gonna summarize a little <laughs> bit because then this really directly connects to what the Facility Advisory Committee will be looking at. 
obviously our profile of a learner, we continue to come back to that. Um, so really the Vision 2030, you can see the little highlight there, what we're focusing on and the FAC committee will, is all intermediate schools will be nationally recognized as centers of innovation, creation, and collaboration. So that is the area. We are not, we had partial presentation last week and we'll continue it this week. And that's why I'm kind of filling into the y'all and know kind of the direction that we'll, we'll be sharing with them. I'd like to go back to that right there and, and briefly summarize five non-facility actions that we are taking already that y'all have been in the discussions on and then we'll look at the facility piece. Implement or align current personalized learning practices, the elementary and looking at that for um, intermediate. Create a sixth grade course for all um, students loosely modeled after the way basics that includes a leader in the executive functioning skills. Three, develop a survey CTE course for all intermediate students that allows them the opportunity to see what they can um, take and kind of somewhat what some options are as they move into high school. Four, increase opportunities for students to develop attributes of a, of a CCISD profile of learner in every classroom and in every course. And then five, designate, and this comes after a lot of questions and even reflection from our last board workshop designate all 10 intermediate schools as schools of innovation. Each intermediate school will have a concentration using the highly successful elementary models that we've seen with RCC and ESTIL. Um, all students will have that opportunity to undertake deeper understanding and you know we know that um, with ESTIM we've had the opportunity and we've even toured to see how all children on the campus have that deeper understanding and you know going to Ward Bauschlag and LCE um, with RCC. It's gone so well that that is throughout the campus and everyone has opportunities with that. So really taking that model and then moving that to the intermediate. You may have a couple of RCC schools. We don't know what that'll look like yet, but just making the facility such that um, we'll actually Will, um, you know, make it conducive to what we need to do. So, maybe envision some of our elementary RCC schools having some roll up and RCC intermediate possibly. And um, those are ideas that over the next year, district staff and, and others will be working on exploring these schools of innovation and what those might, what those um, focuses might need to be. And but we're very excited about the opportunity that really came out of some of our discussions again what about all schools and really we have the model and it's been successful so to facilitate the vision 2030 um, support for these schools of innovation the FAC the facility advisory committee will look at district-wide building enhancements to support the work at all 10 schools and then we'll kind of show you what the options are that they'll be looking at tomorrow and that is on the next slide um, just a summary so just for the committee to look at all of these schools of innovation would have a collaboration space we're looking at four and um, they've looked at these um, Mr. Moses has done a great job of going out with the principals and find four classrooms that can be converted into collaboration spaces, very similar to what all of our new elementary schools have. You know, they have those little areas for collaboration. Um, expanded maker space, take in the library, expand it, uh, maybe make some um, the stacks that can be movable, doing some things to make it much more conducive to collaboration, innovation, creation, like we have in the elementaries. Again, I'm gonna kind of tap back into what we've already done. Um, flexible furniture, I like to consider all classrooms having furniture that can be, is designed to put in clustered <coughs> and desk, um, circles, chairs that aren't necessarily attached so that you can do a lot, a lot more flexibility with limited space. We're not talking about increasing the space size at any school but we're talking about increasing the flexibility um, for all in all campuses across the district with the intermediate. And the centers of innovation, we talked about that, that would be that additional add-on area that could facilitate additional opportunities for innovation in whatever area that is. 
Um, so those are the four columns. So kind of the recommendation, and you can see really looking at collaboration space, expanded maker space, and flexible furniture at all 10 intermediate schools, and the centers of innovation on those that are either up for a renovation, possibly if we're looking at doing a major renovation, and then we also talked about adding space center intermediate individuals. You know, we talked about that last time. Um, this is just the second slide. It just all didn't fit on one slide, but those are all 10 schools. So you can see that. And so you can see the ones that will be delayed to future timing. It doesn't have to happen all now. The schools of innovation would all move forward just like we've done for East Dem and RCC. That moved forward, that was planned, it unrolled, <coughs> it moved forward, and then as we continue to look at possibilities for centers of in innovation, maybe those add-ons as, as we move forward. I want to show you a couple of pictures. This is just some designs, and I'm going to credit Mr. Mill and his team. Alex Aragon have done an outstanding job trying to gather some pictures. This is just your um, blue or your collaboration spaces, and your green is your um, your maker space library expansion of that. Um, this is a renovation of Brookside, Clear Creek Intermediate. This is the same thing. Your green is your maker space library, your blue is your collaboration spaces, and above that is addition of that would be an addition, an area of innovation. So, and I don't know if everybody's seen, we are um, actually going to be meeting at Ed White tomorrow to show the committee this picture. Oh, and this is, um, this is Seabrook's unique. That Seabrook library is so small that the only way the team felt like they could really expand a library at all was to capture that atrium. So that is the only one that looks a little bit different. You almost have to go ahead and create a much larger space in order to do much of anything with it. And that's the Paul's team, you know, really felt like that was a that was the only viable option on that. This is what it looks like at Ed White. That is your addition. That would be your center of innovation. Um, it was about the size of a gym, and that's really kind of was a recommendation all along, kind of that additional size you can see. That's what, it, this is a picture from Ed White. So really going back and capturing what we've already done at Ed White, kind of using our models at the elementary and just elevating those up to the intermediate. So that's a, a picture of that, um, and we'll meet there tomorrow so the Facility Advisory Committee can see it um, and see what that, what those spaces are used for. The key is flexibility. It's not necessarily we're going to do, you know, this is, it's, it's the ability to design and create and meet the needs of our students as we move forward. So I'm going to turn this back over to Mr. Bowman and close it out. And next steps uh, soon, we'll be making our recommendation development and then bringing those preliminary recommendations back to the board. Before we go to questions, which is our next slide, I uh, just want to caveat that over the last 24 years, I've had the opportunity to work in districts across 17 states, all in district improvement services, much like you're doing here. I've seen lots of plans, and Dr. England and her team have formulated probably the best I've ever seen. And I'm not just saying that. I'm excited. The greatest compliment I could ever give a district is, this is where I want my children to go. Well, I'm past that. My kids are grown. This is where I brought my grandkids. I purposely moved here. Now, my wife did graduate from Creek a long time ago. I'm not allowed to say what year. <laughs> but I did bring my grandkids here on purpose, and my grandkids will stay here until they graduate. And we picked a district when my kids were growing up. But this is the district I chose for my grandkids. And I'm very excited to be here. My experience over 24 years tells me that the work you're currently doing will absolutely improve academic performance, increase attendance, reduce issues with behavior and discipline, uh, and overall uh, improve the total health, welfare, safety, and security of this district. And you couldn't have a better team to do it, and there couldn't be a better board behind it. So I'm excited. Um, we're here to stay. And we're going to continue this work to the greatest effort uh, for the children that you serve. Our next slide is about questions. And I can answer questions about the committee and what we do. But if you want to get technical about the work, then you need to talk to the real experts who are sitting right here. So we're opening up for questions now. I'll take any question about our committee and how we're serving. And then these good folks can answer the technical questions. 
I'll open it up to the board for questions. Mr. Bowen. Sure, I, I guess I'll start. Um, and uh, and thank you for the presentation, first of all. I mean, uh, I, I think uh, it, it's very interesting to see kind of what's been gone over with you guys so far. And um, I, I know I was kind of looking forward, too, to seeing what the, um, what the proposal on the Schools of Innovation looks like. And, um, and, and, and while uh, it, it's maybe not quite as specific toward what the eventual program offerings will be, I, I thought that was a lot of good information on what you guys have planned for that. So um, I, I guess going forward, uh, just a couple of questions about the process that we're that y'all are going to follow in, in terms of making recommendations. Um, but my first question is: Is there ever a time where um, either maybe the co-chairs of the committee or uh, committee members or somebody could just sit down with each board member and and we could have a conversation about what each one of us is kind of. Um, expecting from the outcome of this proposal. I mean, I, I think we kind of, eventually what's going to happen is y'all are going to have a recommendation that we will adopt in part or in full or not adopt. And so I, I don't know if it's necessarily fair to y'all for, for us to kind of have you read our minds, you know? Um, is there any way that each of us individually could meet with you guys and, and kind of talk about what our expectations are and what we see is um, kind of a high quality deliverable in the end? And my answer to that, uh, unless anyone else wants to chime in, is that we are absolutely here to serve. We're at your leisure, we're at your pleasure, and Mr. President, whatever you decide for us to do is what we're here to do and to the best of our ability. I'm just going to turn it over to Dr. Ingle. Yeah, well, and I know that, and I'm going to go back because it has been, you know, it's open meeting and Mr. Larson had an opportunity to attend, you know. Couple of me just kind of in the back, you know, absorbing and 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 um, we certainly can provide additional updates if you know whatever we feel like the board needs. Because I will tell you that was this is kind of that process. We were coming back every every workshop. If we need to do something additional, um, we can talk about that and set up a, a schedule with that. I know there have been activities on too so I think that we can we can work work it out if, if that's something that we, we need to, to look at. I, I was going to say that um, I kind of foresee it like we did with Ag Barn possibly uh -huh. maybe taking a tour of some of the facilities so you can see that um, there there is something to having the committee being um, unbiased and have them look at you know our facilities and make the recommendations that they they see. Um, for example, um, but I'm not opposed to you know if you have a question in regards to facilities, if you have a question in regards to how you know uh, the makeup of the school. Um, I know something's already been brought to my attention in regards to losing a possible four classrooms, you know, at uh, Lake City Intermediate, and what that would do, you know, to the school, um, et cetera. So, you know, those are things that I wouldn't mind addressing, but I, I think the committee has already had their, their charges, and, you know, they're, they're kind of on their path. Um, I do appreciate you know, the, the updates that they are providing um, to the board. Uh, I think in terms of that, that's something that's a little unique that we haven't previously done before. Um, but that's that's kind of my my feelings on that. But, you know, I, I wouldn't mind having a conversation with you about that, Mr. Bowen, you know. Can I? Please. Um, somebody who served on this. So first, thank you all very much for the presentation and volunteering to do this. Yeah, I know it's a lot of work. I served on this committee the last go round. I think Christine Sanchez, you were there with me as well. Um, so it's, it's a lot of time and effort and dedication and we appreciate you very much. Uh, I think to uh, Trustee Bowen's question, is it possible when I think back about when I was on the committee, maybe if there are specific questions, that a trustee has um, that may help them consider or you know at least have that discussion 
within the committee your question. Um, that never happened when, when I was there, and I understand we made a recommendation and the board came back and I took out $30 million or something like that. They reduced it um, and you know, voted on it and it went to the voters. Um, but maybe that would be a way to do it is, you know, if, uh, because I see the presentation and I have several questions in my head, um, but maybe emailing the questions and then letting um, you know, the leaders of the committee take it to the committee and say, hey, Trustee Bowen asked this question, um, wants us to know if we're considering hypothetically safety, you know, what are we going about that, you know, where are we going above and beyond. Um, with that, so maybe there's another way to facilitate questions and concerns like that. Um, that as somebody who served on the committee, then the committee could discuss, uh, and then it goes back through all the channels of uh, considerations of any final recommendations to, to the committee to the board. Yeah, I mean, I, I just think ultimately, like, I, I want the committee's recommendation to be something that I can actually vote for, you know? And so I don't want the committee to have to try and read seven different people's minds. Including, uh, <clears throat> including two people who uh, may or may not be on the board when this comes up for a final vote. And, um, and, and so it, it would probably be helpful to y'all to solicit some feedback from us about what we actually want to see in the final proposal. And, and that could include uh, certain projects that, we, that need to be taken care of. It, it could include uh, the overall price tag it could include uh, what our expectations might be about the tax rate or just how it's communicated to the community. But um, the, right now, that hasn't really happened. Um, we're just kind of watching y'all work, and then we get what we get. And, and so it seems, like, it, it seems like that could set us up for conflict down the road if we don't have a meaningful opportunity to advise the committee on what each of us kind of thinks so far. So, so let me try to help, and maybe Mr. Miller can help too. So part of the process along the way is like what we did was um, we looked at everything, right? And, and as we were going, there were kind of stages that, you know, while you're getting through it, and then they, you know, we got to a point where they said, okay, so what would it look like if it was $100 million? What would it look like if it was $2 million? And then you're looking at that as far as tax rates. Uh, again, back then we were expecting a higher tax rate than what ultimately came of it, um, and good economic reasons and property values for the bank. But there's a process to it. Maybe there's something in the process that that you don't, you don't know yet, but it is coming. I know it's considerations. I know that they'll go through um, looking at literally a, an Excel spreadsheet that's adding things in. You know, oh, this is a $20 million consideration. Oh, this is a 30. And as it's going, it's generating a tax so that when they find, make that final recommendation to us, it's all things considered. And, and, and it's down to a lot of little things. And back then, then the board took it to the back room and then decided what, what was and what wasn't really the priority to that board. Okay, so a uh, different question then, kind of kind of based on that. Uh, when is the committee actually going to start voting on what to include in the final proposal? And, and so, Mr. Miller, yeah, I was, I was going to defer, because making sure that we've given, do y'all have the agenda, like our proposed meeting dates? Mm -hmm. I was thinking we did, but sometimes, you know, we, we have a lot of information. So it, yeah, and it's, we, it's changed a little as it we has changed have run out of time on some things, and so we're, we're, we're deferring, we deferred a couple of items mm -hmm. to the future. I think next week's meeting, sorry, tomorrow's meeting, primarily focused on Vision 2030. Uh, following that, the following meeting is where we really start talking about tax rate implications and demographic information and a lot of that detailed information and then ultimately the decision matrix that he's referring to is explained and how that process works. Ultimately, there is a, it's consensus based, right, as opposed to actual physical voting that, that sort of goes through and we walk through that decision matrix that says if you say yes to this, this is what that means in terms of the estimated tax rate implication based on based on our latest information from the financial advisors and all of that stuff is done during that <coughs> during that debate and deliberation um, I think we have two meetings set aside for that 
discussion and analysis and then ultimately would go to the board for a recommendation if, if they come to consensus on a recommendation. Following that would be, I think, the town halls are part of that and then the board reviews town hall information and community information and then provides additional um, input back to the committee and the committee then considers that information, revises their recommendation as needed uh, based on that information provided and then makes a final recommendation in August. So it, it's that after tomorrow night really is where the, we start really deliberating that information. <coughs> Um, we do have, we're adjusting a little bit, but we do have that the committee would come back to the board on May 16th in this similar setting to give you their initial recommendations before we even did anything out publicly. So if, if something comes that you're not on board, I mean, there's opportunities for that to happen. That was our commitment that we would come to you before we went out to the public. And then based on what the public shares back, they might have to do some more work and then it comes back to the board. So there's going to be opportunities for the board to weigh in on those recommendations before we take it out to the public. Okay, so so basically the committee votes, and I, <clears throat> consensus, there's no such thing as a consensus among 80 people, but uh, the, so the committee will vote on what to include at their May 16th meeting, and then it'll come before us on May 22nd? Uh, we, right now we have it as uh, May 16th. May 16th would be a Tuesday. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Um, June 12th. June 12th. June 12th. Yeah, the workshop. Oh, okay, the yes. workshop, okay. Um, okay, so when the committee votes on what to include or not to include, um, can we have like minutes and vote totals of each of those votes? And I, I would like to know, it would be useful for me at least, hopefully for the entire board to know, okay, of the 80 people on the committee, this is a proposal that 75 were in favor of and five were against. This is a proposal that barely made it. 55 were in favor and 25 were against, or 43 were in favor and 37 were against. Like, could we have that kind of information about the elements of the report? I'm not sure that we're going to actually um, take the vote like that. I mean, I, I think it's possible that we have some of that data, but I think too, we have, we truly have talk consensus, you know, and you know, what does that need to look like? Did you want to yeah, share the process that? of consensus isn't necessarily a vote taking, it's um, can everyone live with this? And in the past, when we have um, taken items by consensus, um, when, when there are individuals that might disagree on, on an area, then there's discussion and, and um, well, what if we change this can we live with that? Uh, can you live with that? Um, so it is a model of consensus and not a, a strict vote taking of, of tallying the yeas and nays. It's, it's based on board policy BQA is what we had put in the original, the first uh, committee meeting where we talked through that, establishing consensus as the as a decision making uh, criteria. Uh, so that it really follows that as far as BQA. Mr. Bowen, I, I was going to come back to you. Ms. Checkman, did you have something you want to say? I, I, I like the idea of being involved and having having some input without just you know seeing it for the first time. Um, but I also maybe recommend, because I know that, that I appreciate your time and I know how much time you guys have dedicated to this. And I, I do think meeting individually is probably not practical you know, of their time. But the people maybe that you recommended to the committee, like I would think that they would serve as our eyes and ears on that committee. And so maybe if there are things you really, really want to make sure they're addressed, like I've had conversations with my people and say, how's it going? Here are the things that I would like. And kind of use those as your liaison to the to the committee to get a feel for how it's going. And then also if, if there's something you feel really strongly about, then maybe we voice it to those people and then they're showing up at the meeting and, and voicing what they what their opinion is on. Mr. President, can I make one comment? Uh, and to Trustee Bowen and the, re the remainder of the board, just for a little peace of mind, uh, my co-chair and I and, and all of the members of the committee are also uh, community members, and so we, we pay taxes here to Clear Creek ISD, and so we're also frugal and we're conservative and we want to balance the cost to the taxpayer as much as we want to serve the child. But, Mr. President, when you recommended a tour of the campuses, I, I think that is probably a great idea for all of the board or some of the board members when when we toured some of the older campuses that haven't been through a re remediation or a redesign process 
Uh, we jokingly in our committee called it uh, misty watercolor memories of the way we were. And, and, and just, just, just believe that although we're getting the job done, our children are getting an education, but some of, that, some of those campuses may not be completely regulatory compliant right now. There may be impediments to the learning process. There could be water leaks and the potential for mold. And in Dr. Jensen's work that I aforementioned, even things like smells can impede a child's ability to uh, compete at the highest level and be successful. Um, you know, and Jensen found that, that putting students next to the wing where bread was baking uh, and the smell of the yeast increased their academic performance. Natural light increases academic performance. Uh, there are many things to look at when considering how you approach the total holistic health of that child. And, and so I believe that our recommendations are going to come back to you based on what we think is best for your children, balanced with what we think is reasonable for the taxpayer. But, but know that our agenda is absolutely to give our children in Clear Creek the best opportunity, the best environment, and the best solutions we can provide. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I just want to be sure that the committee process is a fair process, because uh, we've had committee processes in the past that uh, I think intended to work on consensus, but in practice, uh, that by the time they made it to the board, it seemed like the outcome was kind of railroaded through. And so I really don't want to hear from uh, members of the committee I know, not just, not just the ones that I appointed, but uh, I mean, like we all know a lot of the members of the committee because they tend to be more involved. I, I, I just don't want to hear later on that uh, the committee is telling us they had consensus, but in reality there was dissent on some things uh, that was um, quieted. And, and so I always feel like it's, fairer to just be above board about what we're doing and take votes. Uh, if, if something is controversial, if you can't reach consensus, or even maybe if you can, and uh, you might just have some people who, uh, who are quiet, take a vote just to see what the temperature of the committee is. Because I would really like to know if there are some elements of the proposal that have near unanimous support and some that are very divisive and, uh, and not nearly as many people are are sold on, especially when we start looking at the overall package and, uh, and what, what the price of all of that really would be. Because, I mean, things are going to have to be excluded. Uh, we can't complete our entire wish list. We know that that's going to be the case. And so uh, knowing what was very important to every member of the committee would, I think, be very useful. Understood. Mr. Sanchez. Um, Mr. Boatman and Ms. Bailey, I just want to say thank you for uh, taking on not only the volunteer role, but taking a leadership role uh, to be part of a process that is probably sometimes uh, more full and cumbersome uh, than it is easy and simple. But it sounds like with what you've already shared today and your thoughtful perspectives, uh, when we talk about community involvement and hearing from people who are invested, um, every day from their own children to their grandchildren to careers and education experiences that you've had. Um, it, just in the short time we've had the chance to hear from you today, it sounds like you are bringing all of what we need um, in addition to the other committee members. And so I thank you for that first and foremost. Um, as Trustee Cottrell mentioned, we did have the chance to serve in this capacity for the 2017 bond, um, and I do know that it's not easy. Uh, I, I also will just share that I know that there is always lots of lively discussion and what doesn't happen um, in the meetings that take place will happen when we hear from the community when they show up to offer their perspectives and uh, that will also inform anything that changes and from my experience when we did this in 2017 um, there's lots of opportunities for votes. Uh, we'll get the chance to decide what we accept from your recommendation after you've given lots of thoughtful uh, consideration to all the needs and all the variables that really expand beyond what we could get in just a one-on-one -on -one meeting with you. And I also believe we'll get the chance to vote as a board on what we ultimately take forward to the voters. And um, with members of cabinet and with all of our staff across the district um, who provide a level of expertise to specific areas that you're reviewing and considering um, I have the highest confidence that that's ultimately the direction that we intend to go when we put out this process. And, um, and I do believe that it's ultimately reflective of what our community believes is important. 
And, and the final decision will be by our community when they decide, regardless of what we vote to take forward and regardless of what we decide to bring forward um, in the form of a bond, uh, nothing will speak more loudly than the voters that will decide ultimately what, whether they agreed that what came forward uh, or not was what should come forward. So I just want to thank you for the time. I know that it's uh, a lot of work on top of what is always a busy season and what feels busier after COVID, whether that's true or not. Um, it seems that everything is, um, is much busier. I did want to ask through your involvement um, if there's any one thing that stands out in this process and anything that you've been doing that you hadn't expected and that you would be willing to share with us uh, today is just something for us to take away in addition to what you shared earlier. Um, I'll just tell you about a pleasant surprise for me. I know um, just sometimes when you see your news or read your newspapers or whatever, you're not always sure how to approach these committees. So I was pleasantly surprised. I think it was the second or third meeting when um, the numbers were shared about what happened with the last bond and how they were concerned about keeping their word to the public to the point that they went and got the additional 11 million to keep that word. For me, that's huge. I'm a woman of my word. And so if I'm going to work on a committee, I'd like to continue to build the confidence of the community because that's how we shine instead of it looking like business as usual. And, and without uh, just just reiterating something I've already said, I'm just overly impressed with the amount of research and the amount of work that Dr. Engel and her team have done. They, they didn't just go pick up somebody's template or some canned, uh, uh, laid out opportunity to come in and, and, and spend our money making your schools look pretty. Uh, this wasn't about putting lipstick on the proverbial hog. This was about them really going out and doing research about what works best in improving academic services, behavior, attendance, and those are all the things that we need in our community and for our children. And so I was just overly impressed with their amount of dedication, commitment, and actual research and planning. Uh, it was it was very heartwarming. Thank you. Mr. Larson? Yeah, first uh, I, I wanted to say that I, I did have a chance to attend a couple meetings, and it was very clear that the uh, the committee was very passionate about their, what they were doing and very involved. And, uh, you know, I, I couldn't ask for a better group of 80 people to, to go look at, it, look at our schools and uh, come up with good ideas for us. Um, I also wanted to say about that process, um, the biggest reason why I did that is because I just wanted to see some of the same inputs that the committee saw and especially go on the tours. And, uh, you know, that. To me, to me, even if no committee member had seen some of the things I saw, what I did see was still valuable to me as a board member. Um, and that's, and, and, uh, yeah, that's why I would, I'm kind of curious as to what, what you are going to see on the, the next few stops. Uh, the other thing I wanted to mention about consensus is that, um, you know, we, we talked a little bit about uh, the board, the, the committee members are part of the community and we all interface with the community. And we get feedback that way. Um, most of my feedback has been after the meetings are over, various committee members would seek me out, knowing who I am, and we would have conversations. And there was there was a lot of information exchanged. I learned a lot about what they were thinking, and they learned a lot about the district that were basically subjects that weren't discussed at the committee meeting. That you know that they were so curious about that does inform. I'm, I'm sure from the conversations will inform their decisions going down the road. Um, now, you know, I, I can continue to have those kinds of discussions even if I don't go to those meetings by, you know, phone calls, uh, emails, whatnot with the various, various members that I know, certainly the, the ones I appointed. Uh, I just think it would be a little healthier if uh, I instead of going out and doing these little onesies and twosies if there would be some mechanism for the community, um, for the committee to make, um, you know, to give us more feedback and to let, let us know what's on their mind. Um, and not just a, a summation of funneled through one or two people, but 
you know, any individual committee member, if they've got something they want us to be aware of, there, I think it would just be healthy if there was some way to, for them to communicate that. Um, and I do have a question, and I don't think it's a question for you. I think it's, it has to do with the Schools of Innovation chart. And I just want to make sure I understand what I'm looking at. And uh, the, I see the, um, in the right-hand column under Center of Innovation, I see the, the big circles for future edition, and I presume that's not, that's not part of what we're looking at now. And so what I should be looking at are the little check marks where it says included in facility advisory committee review. Okay. And with that in mind, I can, I can really understand why we've got those check marks by uh, Creek Intermediate and Lake Intermediate and uh, Seabrook because those are all older schools that could use a little updating. Um, and even, even to an extent, Space Center. and But, but to a lesser degree, I, I'm not really sure I understand what we need to do there at Space Center and Victory Lakes that we don't need to do at uh, Bayside and Creekside. So you know, I, I didn't see any input on that, and I'm just kind of curious as to how we got to that. You mean Brookside and Creekside, right? Just no, 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 because uh, Brookside, um, we already have special programs at that school. And so this is a future thing for Brookside. And, you know, uh, you can go down the list, and the, the only two schools where we're not doing anything, um, and we don't already have some kind of magnet program or something going on, are Bayside and Creekside. So I was just kind of curious as to how we got there for those two schools. and didn't get there for some of the other ones. Yeah, and that's a great question. We've talked about this so much. Going back to the last workshop, we kind of talked about Victory Lake, something on that side of the district a little bit. But but even Brookside, um, any magnet school, that still is only for those magnet school populations. We're looking at you know something like for school-wide. Um, so I would say that even when we're talking about magnet schools, we want to, um, we would really like to expand whatever it is to all students, you know, so mm -hmm. like if I'm at Westbrook and I'm not a WAVE student, then I don't have really access to those, you know, those services, I guess. But, um, <coughs> but this was just our preliminary kind of recommendation to, to, to move forward, obviously, with the two that need, you know, need renovation, Space Center, and um, probably add Seabrook also, those are the four. And then just added, um, looking at Victory Lakes, but, you know, all of this is really, okay, the schools of innovation will move forward you know, that is going to have, that's why I kind of went through those five things where all these things are going to happen. And if, if every intermediate was touched with collaboration, expanded makerspace, and flexible furniture, then if we're going to do a renovation, it does make sense to add on, but then that might be a good, you know, to come conversation point. And once the pricing is reviewed, is that something that's something that would be recommended now, or is it something to be deferred? This is just a preliminary um, graph, but it doesn't necessarily mean that that's the way that we need to proceed. That would be um, to start, but there's always to come pull back. It goes back to what we said. I mean, we'll probably have to back off of some things, um, <clears throat> but the the Victory Lake ad was kind of out of our board conversation. Um, several board members last time, you know, had yeah. mentioned that, so we put that on there, and that is that is really that makes sense because it's on that side of the district. So, as we continue to get feedback, um, one of the quotes that I talked to the cabinet about today: the important thing is not to stop asking questions. Albert Einstein. We just keep asking questions: is this the right thing to do? Um, so right now, that's where we are, but that has not been presented to the facility advisory committee. Okay. So they'll kind of look through that, and obviously feedback, board feedback, as we'll continue to <coughs> forward. But that was our preliminary reason for those schools being included on there, but that is certainly just a, a proposal at this point. Okay. Yeah. That so I look at that, <laughs> and I see what, what I'm seeing in my mind is a phased implementation where we do 
the ones with the little check marks in 2024 and get started on those and we defer those other ones to some some later date and that this is just a preliminary cut based on the conversations we've had it, it really is and that with that goal of 2030 you know so then then that next phase that you articulated that part that was and i have it written down somewhere yeah okay. a phase in to with the goal of 2030 you know it, with that goal for all time yeah, I think kind of on that subject, uh, my my concern with the centers of innovation is that we're designing spaces before we have programs to put in them, and uh, and the needs of those spaces could change based on what programs we actually come up with. So, for instance, if we can if we wanted uh, a a school of innovation for visual and performing arts maybe it doesn't make sense to have a big common meeting space. It would make a lot more sense to have a performing space or an auditorium or a technical theater or something like that. And, and so, and we just don't, we don't have the program designed yet or finalized. We don't really even have the parameters or which schools they're going to go at. And, um, and, and so I, I kind of worry that choosing schools to put innovation centers at is putting the cart before the horse a little bit. And, and we need to do more work as a board to define what we want those programs to actually look like and which schools we want to take part in them uh, before we start making major renovations to the space. Um, and uh, it could be possible. I mean, one possibility is we just include in the bond proposal that there isn't a, there is not a specific plan for what we want to do with these schools yet. We just set aside a certain amount of funding that's allowed under the bond to do it and, and just make that clear in the proposal that we're, we want to give ourselves the flexibility to do it, but also we don't have the programs designed quite yet to put in them. But uh, what, what I don't want to do is I don't want to uh, lock ourselves in to a specific plan for the centers of innovation when we don't even have the programs developed to put in them yet. Well, and, and that is, I mean, and those so such a lot of discussion around that, and really we felt like collaboration space, expanded maker space, and flexible furniture. That would be for any any time we're trying to develop a profile of the learner. That's going to be that's what we've done in every new elementary. You know, any time we have done a renovation, those have been included. That something different is that center of innovation. That's right. These are pretty standard for all of our bills. But that is, is different. So, you know, is that something I still, you know, and then just going back and we'll, you know, looking at the, the piece at, at, at Y, you know, that is pretty flexible. I would say every part of it, the key is flexibility because you, we have not defined it yet. And, and, you know, I would say RCC, East, the model is there. We, I don't want to say perfected the model, but I would say that they've done a very good job of, of moving that, and then we're going to have um, some support with the designer of both of those. Dr. Mackay is going to help us move forward with this. I mean, we are going to, we do have some some strong um, some strong expertise in what we've done at the elementary to move it up. But what does that actually need to be? It needs to be flexible. We know that because, like you said, we're not exactly sure, but that flexibility is key. Right. And, and I mean, thinking back to Ed White, the, the East STEM, that was purpose built to be an East STEM space. We don't know what the programs are going to be yet at these intermediate schools or even which, which intermediate schools they're going at. And so, yeah, I would, the only thing is I do, we feel we are pretty committed in order to reach that profile of the learner and to go back in our conversations with touching all intermediates, that every intermediate school would be a school of innovation, whether it's RCC, STEM, something, you know, we've got 10, you know, so every intermediate school would have something. Now, do they need to have that additional, you know, extra space added on for that. Um, when East Dem started at, at White, it didn't have the renovation yet. Yeah, you know, and then it kind of moved forward. But every school, after our conversations that we had with the board and with the committee, every school we would like to touch with some type of, it will be a school of innovation. That, that's our commitment. And I think we can, we, I know, I know we can do that going back. I keep, I'm sorry, it makes me dizzy. But going back to that, those three column components, we can make that happen with any school, in, in, you know, and with any content. 
Right. Yeah, it, it's just the last column. Yeah. It yeah. is the one where it, it kind of seems like we might be creating space now in order to come up with a program to put in it later. And uh, I, I think that's kind of the reverse of what we should be doing. Well, and just a flexible space. So I think we can, you know, that'll be a, a good conversation. And that's kind of why it was that phase in plan. And it'll be a good conversation. We'll and continue. I, and I know as we have conversations with our community <laughs> partners, um, you know, I, I throw out their space center and a possible collaboration with NASA. Is that going to be engineering? Is that going to be RCC? Don't really know yet. Right, but if that happened, NASA would come to us and tell us how we could renovate that space to best serve the needs of that collaboration. Possibly. Possibly. So, so, so again, like we would come up with the program first and then design a space that is purpose-built for that program. We don't just create a big space and then decide what to do with it later. I'd like to make a suggestion here because these centers of innovation, the purpose of them is to create excitement, to draw kids in, to make to get the community involved with some program at these schools so that everybody at that school has a reason to go to that school. And I think maybe a good way to go about that would be to go out into the community, especially at each one of these schools, and get their pulse and find out what kind of programs they want at their school rather than trying to just guess at it or go about it any other way. And I would also further suggest that perhaps, perhaps our facilities committee, since we have people from all over the district and representatives from every campus, maybe they can give us some preliminary ideas on that of what kind of programs they would want to see. And I think that would answer, would be moving in the direction of answering Trustee Bowen's questions. And I wonder too, I just wonder, if you know, if you did have the space and then going back and tap into the community, what the, the, the amount of things, I don't know what, it, I don't want to, the amount of equipment that NASA has donated to our robotics is, is a little overwhelming to me sometimes when I see everything. So it could be you have something and then you get the community of businesses to kind of donate. I think that would be a good um, a draw too for community businesses to, to donate to help facilitate that. I, I, I just wanted for that further peace of mind, I, I think I've heard what the board has said and I think Monique and I agree that we're going to continue uh, to do our best to make sure we're asking all the right questions, reviewing all of the information, and then sharing that information as appropriately as possible, both with the board and with the community. And I think Dr. Engel's word about flexibility, and Mr. Moses can explain this way better than I can, is, is that whatever our children need, over the course of years, these centers should be able to evolve to meet that need. And so I don't think we're trying to lock a campus down to do one specific thing because over time, the needs of our children, the needs of our climate, the needs of our community, and frankly, the needs of our country can change. And so the, the district is working to meet those needs over longer periods of time and not box us into just going one direction or on one path. And so I, I think we're going to stay heavily focused. Uh, you can rest assured I haven't seen much, if any, dissension in the group. Uh, my ears are always open, and they've shared our emails. And I asked them not to give them my home address because I didn't want to see all the committee in my driveway. But uh, <laughs> people can call me. They can email me. Uh, and we're going to do our best to stay focused on asking all the right questions, getting all the right data, and then sharing that as appropriately as possible. And can, I, can I add something really briefly? I just like to say that as I've been working with the committee and then going back to talk to even uh, ladies at the front desk, the receptionists, they've been excited about the fact that they have room to grow. One of the things I asked the principals to do was ask your teachers if they had to interview today, what would they need to see to lock it in? Because even the best teacher with the biggest heart, they do have a minimum bottom line. If they still have to go back to chalkboards, which we still do have in some of these schools, by the way, uh, would they really come to us versus 
someone else nearby when they might have wanted to, but that would have been the thing, that makerspace or that, you know, would have allowed them to have the imagination. Even when we buy a house, we don't want to come in and see purple walls. We might want to see, be able to project our imagination into it. And so that's why I'm glad to be able to see that there's room to organically grow and to draw better, even better talent to CCISD. And I'll end with this. When uh, I used to live on Analia, uh, and after Harvey had to shift to this side. So I originally started in FISD. When I came into CCISD, you guys came highly recommended, even though I had never heard of it, hadn't dealt with it or whatever. And I have found that you have exceeded my expectations. I would love for other parents that are being drawn to the district to feel the same way and experience the same thing. And I believe that this would set the stage for that. That's just my humble opinion. I, first of all, I wanted to thank all of the uh, board members for your feedback and for your comment. Um, Ms. Bailey, Mr. Boatman, and uh, please extend our regards to Mr. Steinhoff. I, I believe he's at a uh, swim meet. Um, but thank you for the work that you guys are doing on the committee. Some of the things you said remind me of the two gentlemen sitting to my right when I first had conversations with them. Um, and they were on our 2017 uh, facility advisory and bond committee. Um, dealing with staff, you realize the professionalism that you're dealing with the best of the best, because that's what we're trying to attract. Um, we're trying to provide the best for our, our children, our community, et cetera. Um, but some of the things you hit on, I think, need to be touted because I've heard this before. Oh, you're on the board, you must not pay taxes. <laughs> Is that a perk? <laughs> I didn't, I didn't, exactly. I, 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 let me know. Let me know so I can let me know so I can sign up. But you know, you, you hear certain things and you're like, no. Or, you know, an, a, another favorite one I get all the time, oh I see you had a lot of stuff. Did you quit your job? So you can do this? N no, it's my own time. It's it's free. Right. Um, you know, so those those are misnomers that you hear right. and that you uh, set the record straight. But you know, there are certain things that I take away and I think are going to be invaluable. Um, Trustee Larson has already done it. I encourage people because I understand not all of our schedules are flexible. We work. Um, we, we parent, you know, et cetera, but um, Mr. Miller and Mr. Aragon, if we could possibly, and I don't know if it's an afternoon, I don't know if it's a Saturday, I don't, I don't know, but these are probably conversations and, and discussions that we can have that if our board members want to tour some of these facilities, because I will say this, it was eye-opening, and I heard staff mention it, um, and I'll use McWhorter as a prime example, 113 um, access points, yeah. doors, to the school. And it wasn't until you saw it that you were like, holy cow, I passed that building <coughs> in a week at least five times. And didn't really notice it until I walked it and saw it for myself. So then you recognize, yes, something needs to be done. We just voted on Clear Lake and providing fencing back by the uh, back parking lot and the library. And I can think back, yeah, that's, a, that's an access point or entry point to our school. And we're trying to secure our buildings. So we, we need to do that. Um, so I think, number one, that will answer some of our questions of what we need and what we don't need. Because when you see those, those things are alarming. And whether you have kids or don't have kids, I think you can agree that, that certain things need to be updated, certain things need to be, you know, um, uh, massaged, reworked, you know, et cetera. Um, so I, I, I just wanted to thank you. It, it is a thankless 
um, position. Um, but thank you for the work that you're doing. Thank you for the discussions that you're having. Um, a lot of us have had the chance to sit where you guys are sitting and participate in these committees um, to you know, work with our peers, some that we agree with, some that we don't agree with. Um, but we can have that civil discussion and share our views and get those out. Um, but once again, I wanted to thank all of, all of the trustees for your comments. I also wanted to thank staff for your time as well that you guys are putting into the committee. Um, and, you know, we look forward. I think we will have a couple more times for some updates and things of that nature. So um, looking forward to those discussions. But um, what I've seen in the way you guys have presented today, I just wanted to thank you um, because it, it, it puts my mind at ease that we're going to make sure that we're going to have those fruitful discussions um, and that, you know, we're going to listen to everybody. And, you know, I, I, I think that the members will have an opportunity to, you know, um, let their feelings be known. Um, I, I would like for you, when you go back tomorrow, to reiterate, if anyone, anyone, because I think when I looked at the group, we shouldn't have anybody that's shy. <laughs> but if anyone has a question, if anyone has a concern, please make sure that they relay that so we can hear that or, or get that feedback. Um, because I think that that's important as well. And so, Ms. Bailey. Yeah, I just wanted to um, actually give you all a compliment that I had forgotten about. First, my suggestion would be if you all do decide to take a tour, I nominate uh, Green, I believe it was. One of the things that particularly stood out to me, I had a chance to walk with, I think it's Ms. Gaffey. Uh, mm -hmm. uh -huh, yes, I, she was the one that helped us with the tour. And honestly and unfortunately, uh, they're using all the space they currently have. They have classes for innovation that are actually converted closets. We need to fix that. Um, just like he said, when there's no light in there, the smells, it's a converted closet. I mean, you can only do so much. But the compliment of this comes from my, my youngest son, he's 11, he's at Wedgwood, and um, his teacher, uh, Rhonda Christopherson, has done such a good job that his last star, he scored higher on his reading comprehension than his math, and he's dyslexic. That, if that doesn't say what you guys are doing is working and it's amazing, I don't know what does because he's diagnosed with a whole IEP 504, name it, and he literally scored higher on a standardized test with the reading than the math. And he did so well that he tested out. And they said, well, we think you can fly, you know, and all that good stuff. But that's a, a testament to what we're offering, and I would love to see that expanded with the proper resources in space. Thank, thank you for that. I, I'm, I'm a grandparent. I had one go through Wedgwood, and now she's at Brookside. But uh, yes. um, you know, thank, thank you for highlighting that. Yes. Sir. Um, I, I tell people, you know, it's it's cool being on a committee because you guys get a chance to see um, a lot of the facilities. Um, I, I think, you know, before we've we've taking a tour of the high school I remember um, years ago. Um, so you guys get to see like some of the behind the scenes and, and you know, what's what's happening and what's going on. But uh, once again, I can't thank you enough. And, you know, please keep up the good work. Thank, so, you. thank you. Thank you. And next, we'll move on to the Clean Harbor update. Okay, so uh, Mr. Franklin Moses has been working with Ms. West and Dr. Branch. I think they're going to come up there and join us on a proposal to support students who have dropped out of high school or students who are in danger of dropping out of high school. And um, I'm going to turn the presentation over to Mr. Moses. So thank you. Uh, we got an opportunity to, to 
really look at some options for our students that are, again, as Dr. Engel said, is either dropped out or is in danger of dropping out. And so uh, Ms. West and Dr. Branch have done a fantastic job of working with uh, Ms. Monica Speaks, principal at Clairview, and exploring some opportunities. And so we're going to turn it over to them to uh, kind of give a short presentation on Clear Harbor program that would be housed at Clearview High School. So I'll turn it over to the experts. Awesome. Thank you both. And so, of course, we know the harbor is a safe place. We already have Clearview as a safe place for many of our at-risk students. But we think about our graduation rate, it's, it's averaging 97, 98 percent. What about those other two to three percent? And so we're looking at specifically that fifth year senior potential. Are those students who we are identifying as possibly truly at risk of not graduating and they not yet made the decision to go to Clearview? And so identifying those students, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. But first, anchoring, of course, uh, in our CCSD profile of a learner. And we look at our eight Cs. We can really hold on to this uh, collaborators and contributors and hanging on to the word contributors because really our goal is certainly to make sure that our students would be a contributor in society. Ms. West. And we also want to look at compassion and confidence because we are wanting to provide a safe place for those students to come back. They may have had struggles, whether that was emotionally or their mental health, but providing them with that safe harbor that they can know that they still have an opportunity to, to succeed, this is part of our profile of a learner. And so we want to remove those obstacles um, for them to succeed and then show them that regardless of what comes in their way, they can still succeed. So TEA has allowed a, a program um, offering that would allow us uh, to meet that goal, basically. And so the definition of a flexible school day program, op optional flexible school day program, is directly aligned to what we just stated. Um, allowing districts to provide flexible hours and days for attendance uh, for students who have either dropped out or are at risk of dropping out of high school and in turn um, our graduation rates would be improved. That's the least significant part of this though. We are trying to make sure that we are giving an opportunity for all students and we're talking about that two to three percent. And so we've talked about what the profile of a learner looks like so we're going to talk to you about what the profile of a Clear Harbor student looks like and that is a current CCISD student who has learned, earned at least 12 state high school credits so that's criteria number one. Um, is off track in meeting graduation requirements somewhere along their journey. Things didn't map out quite the right way. Um, they have the credits, um, has a credit need that is more substantial than can be accomplished during a CCISD summer school. In summer school, typically you can only earn, depending on which way you route, most students typically only own one to one and a half credits in summer school. So our students that have get off track don't have that opportunity in summer school or they've been coded as a no-show or a dropout. So we do have an opportunity that when we are finding these students, we'll say, hey, maybe Clear Springs didn't work for you, maybe Clear Falls. We do have another opportunity for you. We are still wanting you to succeed and become a CCISD graduate. So the next thing that we want to look at is the enrollment. So we, in preparing for this uh, presentation today, we did a quick data dive and using those criteria, we found about 80 students currently that would meet the criteria for fall enrollment in 2023 at Clear Harbor. So we looked at students who are off their graduation cohort, something they are, they are supposed to be graduating in May and they are not eligible for graduation. So across all of our schools, we have about 80 students. And then after the initial enrollment, identification of the students would be facilitated by the high school counselor the dean of instructions or an assistant principal on an ongoing basis based on the student's need because we don't want to limit it to just anyone we can identify the initial 80 but the counselors know those stories they will learn about clear harbor they will be able to go i got you another option to get you out of high school or again when it comes before an assistant principal they will know they might be an, into a school and they'll go we still want you to succeed here's another option for you and then once the student has completed all of their coursework at Clear Harbor, they are eligible to graduate from their home campus. So they're not gonna be enrolled at, like a, at Clearview as a student. They actually stay enrolled at their home campus, which is very important for a lot of our students. They wanna graduate as a Clear Lake Falcon. They wanna graduate as a Clear Creek Wildcat. 
So they finish their coursework at Clear Harbor, but come May, when we have our graduation ceremony, they get to wear their school colors and graduate with their peers. Regarding program design, the beauty of this is we already have all of the resources necessary for this program to be implemented and to take care of that 2 to 3% that we're talking about. Um, the uh, coursework would be through our ingenuity platform uh, for both original and credit recovery. Um, the program is designed to be self-paced um, with designated deadlines for those students to complete their, their work, so it could be a rollout uh, for their completion. They, we identify the student now uh, of these 80. Uh, they start this program in August, September. They could finish those additional four credits that they may have been lacking in order to graduate. In October, they are done. Um, they will get their diploma and have the option to, 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 to be a part of their Clear Lake, Clear Creek um, graduation. Um, tracking minutes for all students to ensure minimum attendance and funding. So the state says that a student must attend for this program um, with this um, eligibility, 45 minutes um, per day at least. So they would be showing up, doing that work for at least 45 minutes. Um, and so certainly more because of that self-paced design. And then, of course, um, housing this at Clearview, uh, utilizing the current staffing allotment. So uh, making, um, so make working with uh, Ms. Speaks and her team to ensure that schedule will allow for a teacher to be monitoring um, as those students are working. And then finally, as far as next steps, the state does say in the eligibility requirement, as far as a requirement piece there, that uh, approval must be secured, secured by the Board of Trustees in the district. We would then, if approved by you all, um, submit an application to TEA for approval. Um, it takes about 30 days for the approval process to take place. Um, so as long as we are submitting this in a timely fashion that we are able to start um, in August, uh, we should be okay with that timeline. Um, we would also be researching and updating any applicable policy um, that is related to this. Some examples of things that may be um, addressed would be EIC, EB, EHBC, and FED. Um, so those are some that we know we'd be taking a look at and possibly more. And then, of course, communicating, promoting, and recruiting eligible students. We've already identified 80 um, that would be potential uh, for this program next school year um, who are at risk right now of not graduating with their cohort currently. Um, but we'll be working with campuses to make sure that we are getting those students, capturing them, not risking uh, saying, show back up at Clear Creek for your classes and you know get your schedule. That is a student that we're likely not see again. And so if we have something designed for them, that safe place, that clear harbor, we feel like we can capture and make a difference for that child's life. All right, are there any questions? I'll open it up to the board, Mr. Tro. Um, so where are these students right now? These students right now are in school. Okay. The 80 that we, that we pulled are actually from the comprehensive high schools. So well, not just comprehensive, they're from all of them. So they're part of the 3,026 seniors that we have right now? Not necessarily. They might not be. Most of them are not class, currently classified as a senior. Um, we we look at what we call a cohort. So like when you start ninth grade, the year that you should be graduating, that's your cohort. So these students are cohort 2023, but they might be in 10th grade. They might be in 11th grade. And so they not they have not earned enough state credits to classify to be classified as a senior or. Um, to, to be eligible to graduate. I was working with a family this week that student was classified as a 12th grader. Things have happened in their life and they are trying to find a way to get English for government and economics so they can earn their high school diploma. And a school day might not just be what they need at this point in time. Yeah, I mean, I obviously love the idea and support, you know, every thought or every means possible to you know, get every kid across the finish line. Um, you know, I was reading this and I was trying to kind of take an example in my head and figure out the path, clear view, and now you have clear harbor. And, you know, is there something that, obviously maybe this is what it is, is we don't currently offer a clear path, right? And we don't offer a clear view. So this is kind of in between. 
Not really. I mean, so of course, clear path being a discipline alternative I got that. placement where there is no choice. Right. The student but is placed at risk there. as well. But certainly at risk, right. and certainly in line in some cases um, to benefit from a clear harbor. Uh, clear view, which of course is a school of choice. Mm -hmm. um, many students identify that as a place for them and they find belonging there and they stay the course and they graduate from clear view. We have other students though who have not made that decision to go to Clearview, have not made that their choice, but in many times would be perfect candidates for that program. And this indeed may be that student um, who we've not identified, they've not made the choice to go to Clearview, uh, but yet they are now um, in their senior year, well, would be in their senior cohort, but still only enough credits to be considered a 10th grader or 11th grader. That's the student that we're trying to capture to now offer an additional opportunity uh, for them to graduate from high school. Yeah. I do think it also offers a little flexibility. Um, if I attend Clearview, I go from August to December. My classes are from August to December. A teacher is doing that face-to-face -face instruction. I don't have the opportunity to finish that course, perhaps maybe by October, or maybe perhaps by November, depending on how um, diligent I'm working on my coursework at Clear Harbor. So that is another, I think, a bit of a difference is that that self-pacing module of Clear Harbor could be in the flexibility of the attendance. Um, if I have a job working late at night, I might not be able to be at school at eight o'clock in the morning and so the student could potentially come in because it's based on minutes and not necessarily a traditional school day. So and I'm trying to define that line of kind of demarcation because it sounds so similar to Clearview. You know, I realize what the difference is between path and view, and this is another option. Um, it's more like view, and so, it, it, you know, is it possible a student who's currently at view then says, ooh, this Clear Harbor is a great option because I have more flexibility and I would consider myself at risk, so I would rather go the Clear Harbor route and get out of the you know, schedule, I will call it discipline schedule of a clear view, you know, versus a clear harbor. So, I mean, it's possibilities. That is a possibility. And so as a part of this uh, program, there will be an interview, there will be an application interview, and so we'll be able to identify. Um, and so that student, you know, who has, you know, who is a parent perhaps, um, who is working to support that child, um, who cannot go to Clearview from 8 to 3.30 and would better benefit from this flexible time, yes, that Ms. West just described, um, to have the job to take care of kids. This is designed to really help that, that student too. And we have the checks and balances in place going forward to prevent it from being abused. Correct. Right. That's what it is. When I, when I was hearing your question, it goes back to everyone has a story, and I think we would be able to differentiate who would be a good fit in that interview process for Clear Harbor and who would be maybe a better fit at Clearview based on the story. What is it, what is that <coughs> obstacle that is in front of that student that would make me go, I think this is a better fit or this is a better fit, and those are such individualized <coughs> stories that you would have to hear the whole thing in order to figure out what's the best placement. Is there a check in there to make sure that it's not being abused. Let's say a student is supposed to go to clear path and then someone says, well, I want to drop out and then decides, well, maybe I'll can come back and go into a clear harbor. That would not be a possibility. If that mandated placement for clear path is clear path, then it's clear path. Right. So we would be uh, working with that. that. I would think that's probably in the student file. Likely. Yeah. And then they would probably be caught in the interview yeah. process. Right. And, and in many cases, students at Clear Path are on the list for Ms. Speaks and her team to meet with mm -hmm. to see if that student indeed is a better candidate uh, for Clear View versus returning to Clear Creek or Clear Springs uh, for various reasons. So that does serve as a pipeline for sure, uh, but certainly there is a process with, um, with, with the application and interview and that sort of thing as well. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Bond? Yes. Uh, so, what is, what is our overall capacity at Clear? Like if we filled every single slot in Clearview, whether it was with uh, Clear Harbor students or just traditional <coughs> Clearview students, how many would it be? Current staffing would allow Mr. Moses probably 300 students. 
um, based on the current staff. 400. Okay. And because and right now we only have about 204. And is, is there, why is that happening? Why, why are we not able to fill up? Because, I mean, I'm looking at this program and I'm thinking these are probably students who earlier on, if we had, like if we had caught them earlier on, they probably would have been good candidates for Clearview. Um, are, there, are there students who are wanting to go to Clearview who are not able to, or, um, or, or is there just not enough demand to fill all of those spots? I think the demand is increasing because I think our numbers have gone up. I do think that um, our students typically try to come finish high school with their peers, and so it usually takes um, them acknowledging that maybe they do need that different setting, and that is even if a counselor is talking to them about it or an assistant principal is talking to them about them until they get to that point too, then I do think we're, like I said, we're seeing an increase in the number of students at Clearview. It just, um, I think that it's it's just a different journey for everything, every student. It's a different journey for every student. And it's also uh, one of those pieces that I know that Ms. Speaks and her team are constantly working on just a community perception of that program. Um, there are still some parents who may say that if my student is uh, thinking about Clearview, that means they've given up on being whole at Clear Brook or Clear Springs. And so um, constantly working on that and promoting, I know that Ms. Post and her team do a great job with teaming and partnering so that um, the word is out there as far as what Clearview is, who Clearview is, and who they serve. Um, so that's really an important piece to that. I will, do, I will add that having been a Clearview counselor before, um, when it got to being some of my juniors and seniors that came during their junior year, um, usually about that time they're like, I really wish I would have known more about this when I was a 10th grader, when I was a 9th grader, because they do find a home to belong to when they get to Clearview. Um, so we are doing our very best to promote it, but again, until that student can sometimes see it and, and live it and be a part of it, they don't make the connection back to it. I want to mention one other thing too, just a data point. During um, the pandemic, we did not have online learning at Clearview, so any student that wanted to do the online were, was connected to their home campus. We just didn't have the staff at view, so that took a dramatic drop, decrease in the enrollment, and that's building back up. But it did see quite a decline. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. Mr. Um, I have a few questions. Uh, the, um, the plans for the up to 80 students uh, that would start, would they be in separate classrooms based on the grade level that they're at? Or how would that, how does that work? They would all be in separate classrooms, perhaps just on the number, because of course we couldn't accommodate any students in one place, but um, they would be at mixed levels. And so because they are working, you know, on a device, you know, through the self-paced ingenuity, um, there would be certified teachers there um, to supervise and offer support. Um, but as far as those students, they would be a mixed, a mixed grade level, perhaps. The, the framework that we looked at is like if, during this time frame, if you're working on math, you, regardless of what math you're working on, you would be in a classroom with a certified math teacher. When you're working on an English subject, you would be, so I'm thinking like four to five different type classrooms, not necessarily based on 10th or 11th. And that space, I'm assuming that we have, when I, I looked back at some notes from the facility advisory committee, I think it says that the um, building itself can accommodate 350. Um, so definitely it's within range. So I'm guessing it just means that we'll coordinate the clear view classes possibly a little bit different, just ensuring that they stay to in their respective spaces. That's right, to ensure that that core teacher is available for supervision of and supporting those students. And so is that, is then the teaching staff that's currently at Clearview, then this is essentially maybe utilizing their existing time differently so that they're... Yes, so okay. maximizing their class size um, to create an additional period so that they could supervise okay. or support. And the, um, I, I remember during the pandemic we got some different feedback on the quality of Edgenuity um, courses, and I'm just wondering how we feel about that 
um, as far as how it's evolved and how that will meet the needs of students who are going to be really dependent on that in order to complete the requirements and graduate and go back you know, to graduate with their um, classmates. I'm just wondering what that looks like. So there will be some work with Dr. Silva's team and, of course, Ms. Ms. Simons with the coordinators. We have a few of the Ingenuity classes that have been customized um, and looked at by our coordinators and really crafted um, to reflect CCIC standards, and so we would expand that in talking to Dr. Silva. That's correct, yes, and we've already adjusted many of the courses because we do have some ability to control that and that help it align to our current curriculum and things like that. So the other piece I'll add to as we're adjusting those courses is that um, the I think we struggled the most when the, when the students were away and didn't have that good access to a teacher to support them. And so the setup for Third Harbor and having a, a teacher, a math teacher who can support those students in whatever the math content is that they need, I think is to help them um, get through that. It is self-paced, so it will require some initiative, and so an additional layer of support for that from a teacher is, is powerful. So. And then the last question I have is um, recognizing that these students are at risk of, in some way, um, is there also capacity within the existing counselor staff to provide assistance to them, or do we envision having some additional counseling support? Um, just because I imagine, I mean, it's the number 80 is great, um, but then I just imagine the complexity of what each student comes with and what they're challenged with, and whether it's that they're working full time to help meet family requirements, if they've started their own family, if they are commuting um, and struggling to get to campus. I'm just wondering what that looks like, uh, making sure that they've got those supports in place. Well, I was going to ask the same question, like, were they going to keep their their school counselor? or? Since those students would be graduating from them, their home campus, they would still technically be enrolled in their home campus, so they would have their home campus alpha counselor monitoring their progression on the graduation requirements. And it would also be there in case they did need additional support. Very much like our, and yes, we would still have our two amazing counselors at Clearview to be um, there to support them during the day-to-day, -day, um, exist what, what they're going through day-to-day. -day. So I feel like we would really be able to provide true wraparound services. Um, the other good news is very much like a pattern, like a, a model we have with our Clear Path students, our counselors from our comprehensive counselors campuses do go over and visit with their students at Clear Path. So that is something that if you're, if I'm being notified that a student is close to graduation, I'm probably going to need to go check in with them because this is what I show you have. This is, so we're getting all of our checks and balances. So they would actually, I think, have really great wraparound services. Thank you. And the other question I had, um, how, if you don't mind me asking, how did you identify the 80 students um, I ran a report for students who were off their cohort, their graduation okay. cohort. That's okay. where we found them. Gotcha. Um, could that be a way to identify view students, potential view students? It could be, yes, okay. sir. Okay. And it, like, again, this one, they have to have the 12 credits to be considered for Clear Harbor. Right. So our students right. who are off cohort that are in grades 10 or 9 right. could potentially be good referrals for Clearview. Gotcha. Okay. Ms. Chapman? Um, I, I love the idea. I think we definitely need a place for those kids to feel like this, the buckets that we have currently. Um, so if, if a student comes into Clear Harbor, is there an option to go back to their home school, or do they stay there until they get ready to graduate? What would that path look like? So the difference would be if they were to go back to their home campus, they would be uh, with a full schedule. Right. That does not allow for the flexibility that Clear Harbor would. And so that's the primary difference. So the idea is once they're there, they would stay there until their graduation and then still walk with their home. Correct. Okay, and then um, would we be providing transportation? So that would be one of those pieces that we would have to work on and look at um, yeah. with uh, Paul's department. We we'll talked about it with, with Paul and his group. We do currently provide some sort of transportation to Clearview. Um, and so if they would stay within those hours, obviously we'd be able to do it. But if you start talking about those students that may show up at 10 o'clock, leave at 1, 
that would be very difficult, difficult. to provide. Right. That, that would be a specialized situation. Okay. But if they were willing to work with our schedule, there is an option for transportation. Very based much like based, based, on, based on our current fair view transportation schedule. It would limit their flexibility. Yeah. Right. Um, and then I know you mentioned like dropouts. Like, do we have a system in place where we could go back and see those kids maybe who have dropped out this last school year and, and be able to pull them in? And so one of our goals and intentions would be to identify those students and pull them back in. So um, the state does allow us to recover students who have indeed dropped out. So right now that 80 um, is the, that's the at risk of dropping out number. So 80 um, is how many are in the classroom still, so that would not account for any that we could pull exactly. in from the Exactly. Right. Like the example I gave, there was a young right. lady that withdrew. Yep. Um, and now family is looking for away because their alternative plan did not work out and so I think that that would be a great opportunity I would have been able to go let's go let's get this done and and we do have attendance officers that work with students trying to locate our students that have dropped out so we would now have an option to offer them to get them back and re-engaged as well Thank you. Mr. Larson. So um, when I first looked at this, I thought, wow, this is a really good option for somebody who uh, is in a situation where they have to work during the school day or maybe stay home and take care of a sibling or their own kid or something like that. And uh, I just, I, I guess uh, uh, one question I would have is when you went through and uh, did this sort on these, these students who might fit, did you find anybody who this wouldn't help. In other words, I, I see this as just a way to uh, to get in and do some schoolwork if you're on a, quote, non-traditional schedule. Is there anyone that that wasn't the issue and that that wouldn't help? Um, I don't, we didn't do a deep dive on every single student. Right. So again, like I mentioned, everyone has a story so I do think that even with an ingenuity, we have worked with our special education team so that we know how to make modifications within the core content of the coursework. So I feel like we have options there for students who might need modifications to the coursework. We could still assist them. Um, our emergent bilinguals, I still feel like there are um, things that we could put into place to assist them if they have a certain um, if they are being successful, like if you've gotten 12 high school credits, you've had some success at a normal high school campus. And so I don't see where there would be a barrier to prevent any student from succeeding in this particular program um, as far as them accomplishing the goal and receiving their credits. And a heavy reliance, of course, on those folks who know these students best. So that's their assistant principal, their dean, their counselor, uh, with the identification of if this would indeed be great track for them. So what I'm getting from that is you've looked and you haven't found one yet. Not yet. Right. Okay. That's, a, that's actually, uh, that's encouraging. And the other thing is, um, I, I'm, and I'm just trying to understand what this is a little better. So this requires some minimum amount of physical presence at Clearview. And, and I think I heard something about 45 minutes. Can you tell me again what what is the minimum that a student would have to do to be part of this program? So according to the application, it is 45 minutes daily, or 45 minutes in order to account for the attendance period or funding, um, because it is tied to funding. So going through this process for approval says that if a student, Robert, attends uh, for 45 minutes to work on his ingenuity, um, then the district would be funded for his attendance. And so that is the minimum requirement in a day. Um, to be present. Okay, okay, but uh, we, we talked about that being for you know irregular as far as what days of the week they come in. So would that would that be one day for forty five minutes, and you can sort of creep your way to to maybe getting a class or two in, or is there more than that that's really required? So, so the idea is that the student would work with the people during the interview to determine a plan moving forward. Maybe this student can only come in for an hour and a half per day. Maybe this student can come in for four hours a day. This student can come in for five hours a day. And so they, it is self-paced, so it allows them to move at the place yeah. which that is comfortable for them according to some of their um, situations, if you will. From a funding standpoint, the optional flexible program allows us to receive funding for ADA 
you know, a minimum of 45 minutes per day. So that's where that minimum piece comes in. In other, in order, in other words, for us to capture the ADA, they have to have been present in, in the location for at least a minimum of 45 minutes. Every day. Every day. Every day. So, so Monday, we say schedule no. It, you're still Monday through Friday for at least 45 minutes. For us to capture. So, so there's no the way. We could have been there on Friday, but we still let them in the program. Yes. That, is that what you're saying? Yeah, that's what I'm yeah, getting yeah. at. If, if, if I can't come in on Wednesdays and Thursdays, yes. how do I do that? Do I still have five periods that I have to, five 45 minute periods that I have to be there Monday, Tuesday, and Friday? No, it, we would have a block skip. Yes, they would still be expected to be, like their schedule would be the same every day. But if we knew that you had to work on Tuesday or Thursday, Tuesday and Thursday, Tuesday, we would know you would be gone. But then the expectation would be that you are still maybe giving extra time on a particular day to get some work done. Like the work still had to be done. So it's five times 45 minutes per week. No, that, that has nothing no. to do. The 45 minutes is based solely on ADA. Okay. That is the only reason the 45 minutes is involved is the optional flexible, flexible program allows for ADA for districts to capture that ADA based on the 45 minutes. So if the student doesn't come, we don't get that ADA period, or that ADA money for that student. Okay. So. For that day. For that day. So a student, just like any other student in the, in the district, if they're absent on Wednesday, we don't get that money for that student on Wednesday. If this situation that you're referring to as, a, as an example, that student has, has to work on Wednesday for whatever reason, and there's no way they can get in at any point in time period, they can still come Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday for, you know, three hours, four hours, you know, depending on their work schedule. Again, that's something that they'll be working out through the program. The 45 minutes is just based upon the capturing of ADA for districts and funding. Okay. It has nothing to do with the actual program. Okay. From an academic standpoint. Yeah. <laughs> still got to get the work done. Well, well, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, I guess I'm still struggling with this. So, it, 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 when you say self-paced, then is that at least one class per semester, or however you jigger the time around to, to get it done? It might just depend on what the student needs. If, the, like the example I've been given, if the student needs English, economics, and government. We might start them off in an English for A class and a government class, and when they are completed with that, then we'll move on to two more, just depending on on how they made it through the first two. If they feel like they can handle more than that, we would try more than that. And if they took them from August until October to finish those first two half the first two half credits, then we would switch them into English for B and economics, and would take them through December. And I think that. It all depends on the student's motivation as well as far as how they pace through the, it is self-paced, so if I can get done sooner and I can graduate and that needs to be in my rear view mirror, I have the opportunity to work through that. Okay. I, I, I think that's about as good as we can do today. <laughs> <laughs> right. Any further questions? Thank you very much. We will talk about uh, board budget goals. Okay, so this I will provide um, the board a review of the current budget goals, assumptions, and priorities, and endless trustee feedback for next year. Right. I was going to say good afternoon, but I'll say good evening. <laughs> so we've uh, moved along in our timeline uh, this evening. Um, I wanted to give, uh, it's, it's that time of year, usually, and Actually, April, we, we have the board go through the uh, goals, assumptions, and priorities for the coming year, or for the next year uh, year's budget. This year, of course, is a little bit unusual because we are in a legislative year, and so there's a lot of unknowns. Um, just a little bit about our ongoing budget analysis. Back in, uh, at the April board workshop, we did a, a budget update for you. Uh, as you know, our enrollment and attendance drives our budget revenues. So our enrollment is currently sitting at about 40,649, and our ADA is running at about 93.9%. Um, it's 37,440. 
Uh, we discussed the formula transition grant piece of our revenue and how we're, uh, as a district, we're starting to uh, kind of come out of being a formula transition grant district. It's, uh, the funding is about four and a half million dollars this year. Uh, so, so that hopefully uh, will be in our rear view mirror. And we are still anticipating a $10.5 million deficit this year and utilizing 19% of our capital and contingency fund uh, to cover that deficit. As far as our financial forecast coming, for coming up, we had um, a projection right now of about $18.6 million. That uh, was assuming a $150 increase in our basic allotment. If, if this were the case, that would utilize, require utilizing 43% of our capital and contingency fund. Um, we do have our spring demographic report came out last week and uh, they anticipate a loss of about 300 students. They are still seeing growth in the district, but what's happening is that we are graduating larger classes than we're bringing in at the kindergarten level. So that uh, difference uh, kind of overshadows any of the growth that we do have. Uh, and that's gonna, that trend's going to continue for a few years out. Um, we have so much legislation going on, so many changes every week. There's, there's uh, new things coming through. So uh, that is going to provide a, a big challenge for us this year and a, we have a short window to make some very important decisions. So uh, that legislation we know will have an impact on our revenues, uh, it will have an impact on our tax rates, and it will have an impact on the compensation increases that we provide. Uh, we do know that there, we will probably have further tax rate compression uh, through legislation. Uh, we will have probably an increased uh, state mandated homestead exemption. Uh, that's one of the, the things they're, they're looking at. And we're also seeing some possibilities of additional um, golden pennies available, a six golden penny <coughs> available without voter approval. So there's many things out there that um, will impact our budget coming up. So we'll, we're keeping a close eye on those. Uh, we have been, um, as, a, as a district or, or as a cabinet, we've been identifying areas for reduction. So far we have identified 71 uh, full-time equivalents, totaling about 4.1 million uh, in expenditures to uh, reduce. And we will be meeting this week for two days with our strategic budget sprint team to uh, provide feedback on revenue enhancements and uh, expenditure reductions so that we can, uh, or Dr. Engel can provide some recommendations to you. So over the past several months, we have uh, received feedback from really three groups, our Citizens Financial Advisory Committee, our um, DEIC Subcommittee on Budget, and also the superintendent's cabinet. I sent, uh, we uh, came up with some budget priorities in all of those groups, and I sent those out in the Friday packet just for you to review. Um, as I said earlier, normally we do this review and or, uh, the board reviews our priorities in <coughs> April and March, or March or April, um, but as we know, there's so many moving parts right now. So um, it may be the board's preference that we continue, uh, we look at this data tonight and continue this for final approval either at the May board meeting or at the June board workshop. Um, the June board workshop is on June 12th and we'll have a, a lot more known uh, pieces that we just will not have at the May, uh, May board meeting. So I have provided, oops, let's see. Um, I've provided in the information tonight what the board approved uh, in 22-23 for the goals, assumptions, and priorities. And what I thought I'd do is I've broken it down and just uh, thought we'd go through it page by page. If you want to give feedback, we can, we'll take notes and um, utilize any of the notes uh, for the, um, when we come back for final uh, approval of those. So um, really the budget priority or the budget goal, I've changed the date, um, but the 23-24 budget will further CCISD's mission and strategic plan with financial integrity, maximizing benefits from available resources. Um, I'm 
I'm not sure if there's are there any modifications or does that look reasonable to maintain that? Okay. And um, these were the assumptions that were developed last year. Um, and I will go through, I actually have them broken down on, on a couple pages. But the first assumption is to meet budget requirements without accessing more than 20% of capital and contingency reserve funds. Um, we will manage the district's resources efficiently and effectively, including identify, identifying ways to increase revenues in or decrease expenditures to achieve a balanced budget by 2025, 2026. And I think that will be something we'll be looking at as we get more clarity with, from legislation um, to determine when we can achieve that um, balanced budget and, and set a date there. Um, there are two um, bullets on assumptions regarding our tax rate and exemptions. The first was to retain the 5% local homestead exemption uh, through fiscal year 25-26. And there was also an assumption to not include a golden penny or other tax rate increase through fiscal year 2025-26. Um, so those would be two factors that would um, uh, affect our revenue for the coming year. Um, those are areas that we know we'll see some modifications in legislation as well this coming up. Um, and then finally, take additional steps to prepare the district for loss of state funding after 23-24 budget, including es establishing a committee of citizens and staff to focus on options for expenditure reduction. So we are... Um, that would, uh, this is in reference to the loss of uh, the ESSER funding that uh, we are utilizing currently to carry some of our general fund expenditures. So really that, fast, yes, was that committee actually formed? We um, formed an internal committee. Uh, we had an internal committee last year. We also formed, have been working internally this year with staff. Uh, the strategic budget sprint team is incorporating citizens into that. Um, we're scheduled to meet Thursday and Friday. We, it's a sprint. It's a lot to take in for uh, two half days. So uh, we may envision pulling them in um, more than that, more than just these two days. Okay. I'm sorry. Uh, your citizens advisory committee. Yeah. So we. We've, continue the Citizens Financial Advisory Committee. It's a small group, and some of those folks have been incorporated onto the Strategic Budget Sprint Team as well. Yeah. Yeah, I, I'm just kind of thinking back to the discussions we had last year. I, I think the vision there was kind of to have a, like, not, not a sprint, but a purposeful committee of citizens and staff that could kind of, I don't know, maybe on a regular basis be looking at, uh, at our expenditures and making recommendations. So again, <coughs> That, that way we don't have to try and do everything all at once and there aren't surprises to people. Like I, I know some of the changes in counseling have been surprising to people. Um, and, and so I, I think, I, I don't know, it's kind of, I'm kind of disappointed that that was never done, it seems like. Like it, it was something we voted on as a board and then it never happened. And I know there was a lot of turnover that happened in between those dates for sure, but Anyway, that's. And we can definitely look at that again. I think we're going to have so much more clarity when we find out what the state's going to do. I think it's been a challenge um, for us determining expenditure reductions and how much to reduce. And there's so, you know, we don't know what our revenue is going to be, basically. So, right. um, but I think the the sprint team is a start with that, and um, it'll be a learning experience for those folks on there, um, an introduction to you know, where our funds go and how we bring in funds as a district. And so there may be quite possibly a need to continue on uh, with that team throughout the next year. Okay. Because Thanks. there is, you know, if you recall the forecast for the following year, there's a right. quite a big dip deficit, additional deficit the following year, and so I think the conversation will have to continue. 
Um, following up on budget assumptions, uh, the budget will meet our capacity and growth needs, assuming no enrollment growth above 22, 23 levels. So that may be, and uh, you know, where we'll want to put in some enrollment declines uh, that the demographer is uh, anticipating. Uh, be developed using a realistic and defined average daily attendance for the fiscal year. Maintain an ad adequate general fund balance that's uh, defined as two months in fund balance uh, in board policy. And then including a focus on developing alternative revenue streams. So these were uh, the final board priorities that were adopted last year. Uh, the um, first one was to provide optimal and targeted levels of funding and staffing for improved student achievement to meet the goals identified within the strategic plan and to address any learning gaps from the impact of COVID-19. Um, we frequent, well, annually we have administered competitive salaries, stipends, and benefits for all employees. Uh, we want to continually continue to sufficiently fund the Safe and Secure Schools program, including student support and counseling services and then maintain designated disaster recovery reserves and continue capital and contingency fund reserves consistent with other budget priorities. And finally, leverage excess reserves and existing funds for financial support to meet current budget challenges. Finally, our budget risk. I think our budget risk will, um, they kind of stay the stable from year to year. Uh, budget risk of spending required by unfunded state and federal mandates. So we'll be looking closely at any legislation that comes out to see if there's any new uh, mandates that we have to fund. Uh, we always have a risk of our student enrollment or ADA coming in below projections. Uh, we've seen the impact of inflation of, on our fuel, our property and casualty insurance and other commodities. So that has been a continual concern. And then uh, just in general, inadequate funding to meet the needs of Clear Creek ISD students and the potential risk of sustainability of current programs. So these were um, the board's uh, uh, risk priorities and risks that were adopted last year. And um, you know, we'd be happy to make any modifications now or we can uh, come back I'm to your pleasure. For, I'm all for waiting until we have more clarity on yeah. what, what funding looks like, what legislation comes through, you know, et cetera. I, I just, does that sound feasible? Yeah. Clearly we'll have all the clarity based on the legislature, right? I mean, in order for us to make revisions to these, I think we'll still have to make some in advance. Yeah. Right. Okay. Um, you know, it, it will have it at the end of May. Sometimes it takes a while to diagnose what has been uh, set up uh, to interpret everything. I'm even wondering if we could tackle this during our work uh, retreat. Just an idea. And then we will have this budget sprint and we'll have some some recommendations or some, some even recommendations or just some thoughts about you know, actions that could be taken, revenue, um, enhancements, also expenditures that we'll be able to share also. Great question. Um, the Citizens Finance Committee, um, have y'all discussed, discussed this? And um, they, I've included at our last meeting uh, that I had with them, uh, we did come up, there's some goals and budget goals that are included in your packet. Uh, so we, we reviewed the you know, budget status and had a discussion. I just, I just wonder if, yeah, going into this in depth with that group and, mm -hmm. um, you know, they all know something priorities. There may be some additional feedback or information from that group that may help us and us as a board to consider some of their thoughts and recommendations. Mm -hmm. They may have some risk in mind that we haven't thought of. Um, and I know not to jump into this into too much depth, but you know, with risk and earlier you're talking about 71 FTEs being eliminated and that's the risk of where we're at with the budget going to the next the next. Um, but you know 
having that discussion with that group? Um, and are there people on the sprint committee from that group as well, so that they're both talking? Because um, I really think that both committees can help bring a lot of great ideas and yes. you know, perspective on, you know, obviously, anytime we we're spending 43% of our capital contingency and our loss deficit of 18 million and all that, we every idea and every option you know, on the table. We invited um, all of the Citizens Financial Advisory Committee members to uh, the Sprint Group. Uh, unfortunately, because it's held during the day, not all of them can attend. But we do have um, probably, probably five, maybe five or six of them that are attending uh, this week for that meeting. But well, I would definitely like to get their feedback mm -hmm. on what they think some of those goals, assumptions, and priorities should be. And there, Since they're having conversations about our finance. Yeah. So that the you do have on the Friday packet one of the you do have their um, they they tossed last their last year's um, at priorities that were out there and um, in looking at the budget and the current situation they had some pretty specific ideas. So uh, there's short they had listed seven things as goals. Um, that we will continue to, to um, meet with them as well to get more feedback. A, a couple of questions that maybe you don't need to answer right now, but that I, I kind of want to make sure that we have at the front of our mind when we start looking at property taxes especially. Especially, I, I think I said it, especially. Uh, but, um, it, so how close are we to having to pay recapture. If we, if we add too much more, like, like if we start using golden pennies or if the, um, if the appraisers start adding to property values too much, how, how close are we to having to um, possibly start paying the state? Are we way far away from that limit or are we getting to a point where we might run into it? Um, I'll have to figure that. We won't because we have, well, we have some golden pennies left, they're not, and some of them would require voter approval, and those wouldn't be subjected to recapture, but I'll, I can do some calculations. Yeah, I, what, what I'm more concerned about there is appraisals, because mm -hmm. as appraisals go up, like what the state is looking at is your total property value. And so, may, I, I don't know, Galveston County may think it's helping by increasing appraisals a bunch, but it could cause us to run into that cliff. And, and so I, I want to make sure we're very careful about that. Um, and uh, th that, that was the biggest thing for now. Could you be sure to share the uh, demographic report with us? Yes, yes. Um, we met with them last week, and there were a couple of things that we wanted them to double check on regarding our charter schools and um, students leaving, going to you know, ch uh, charter schools, making sure their numbers were correct. So he did get back with me today, and um, so I'll have that out in the Friday packet. In, in the demographer report, do we have any visibility into how many children uh, within, the age, within the age group that we serve are in home schools, charter schools, other districts, um, or private schools? I mean, is, is that something they look at? We have data that reflects um, the uh, TEA maintains data on um, our students located here that are, are going to other ISDs or charter schools. I don't know that it reflects the private schools or home schools, though. But yeah, I, can, yeah I, I, I guess what I'm interested in there is, is it the entire child population of the area dropping, or is it is, it, is the child population still increasing and they're just not choosing us? Uh, they're choosing other options kind of as their children get to that age. And, and so I, I'd be really interested to know what the driver is there. Okay. Um, one of the, the factors right now is the, the slowdown in the economy and the home, the home growth. Um, the building has slow, slowed down, uh, especially on the west and west side, which is where we're seeing the um, most potential for growth is things are slowing down just because of interest rates and there's a natural progression um, in the current economy for, for things to slow. Um, but it's, it's an older, older, um, 
we're aging out as a district. There's not as many uh, new homes, the price of our homes, but uh, they do look, he has some key points in that demographer report that specifically address that. Okay. And, it, and a lot of it too is really that the large 12th grade classes falling off and smaller kindergarten um, groups yeah. coming in. So. Yeah, I mean, and if that's the case, then this train isn't stopping, and we're going to keep losing kids every single year, and that's that. That is a pretty terrifying picture of the future, and so it, it should really make us reflect on whether it, it, are we doing something that is driving that drop, or is it just uh, our population is changing, and and if or is it a combination of both? Because if the answer is the former then that may be a problem we can fix. I mean, we have a, a, our, our budget problem. We're going to try addressing spending, but it's not a spending problem. It is an enrollment problem. We just, we're not bringing in as much revenue as we used to. And uh, I mean, the, the state's gonna do what it's gonna do. The tax rate is what it is, but that is, the, that is what keeps changing. And, and so we have to figure out a way to reverse the decline. We'll say too, we did see an interesting um, a decline in enrollment at the intermediate level, some drop off there, and then re reboot the ninth grade. Now, ninth grade, you have nine repeaters. Sometimes that's an artificially high number, I guess, but that's part of this intermediate you know, review. What can we do to enhance those intermediate schools? That is part of the drive. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Anyone else? I was, going to ask, I was going to ask just a few of the dates um, on some of the assumptions. Would we adjust those out at least for one additional academic year? Or I think the one, at least what was in our packet, it was showing the 22 23 uh, goals, assumptions, and priorities. And I just wondered if we would push those out beyond the 25 26. Um, or were you, were you suggesting we would keep them at that point to start? I don't have any suggestions on those. I'm, I, okay. you know, I think it's the board's, you know, whatever the board's wish is or what, you know, how they want us to move forward with the budget, that will be totally up to the board. Um, I can give recommendations, but um, yeah, so that's I, definitely something we can discuss. I, I guess something that I would just ask is given all the numbers that you see every day, I imagine when people talk to you, you don't really hear words, you just hear numbers. <laughs> <laughs> that's what I, I mean, that's just what I imagine. And so, and I think that language is extremely valuable to inform things that we would consider, things that we would propose, things that we would um, feel could be traded or explored or prioritized. And I think, um, you know, th this is, this is essentially a, a guide or a roadmap to give us a sense of things that we have to consider as a district that factor into our planning and, and ultimately what you're managing every day for us. Um, it would just be really helpful to have some recommendations um, and then have even a bullet or two that just says, and this is the reason why. Or, or if you pull this lever and you decide to extend or to reduce then this is what you have to be prepared to make up for somewhere else. And at some point, all the options are great, but they don't allow us to change all of them. There's going to be some that have to remain or have to, you know, have to be at a certain point. And so, I just think, um, from my experience, the last six years, um, you and the team and, and others that have contributed bring us the best information, at least to start with. And so before we dive deep and then offer recommendations that don't have all of that context and content behind it, I think it's really helpful for us. Um, so I would just ask if that's possible. Uh, I think it would help us get to a better place. And, and I think we still hold out hope that the legislature um, will, will do the right thing. And I, I appreciate Mr. Bowen's comment about you know, the enrollment um, being the challenge, but I think we shouldn't give the legislators a pass 
on funding public education. Mm -hmm. I think when we talk about inflation, when we talk about the rising costs, we recognize that those are not staying stagnant. And despite demographic changes, at the end of the day, the formula doesn't add up. And that, that's still something we have to hold people accountable to as well. And so when we have to make trades that start with less than because the funding isn't being provided, I think that's also that also should cause us concern. Um, so I just think it's important for us to, to think about that. I'm, I'm hopeful that with people who recognize that in Austin in a legislative session where there's more funding than they can spend, that they will be making some decisions that support public education. And I think we should take note when that, if, if it doesn't happen, I think we should talk about that too for months after the legislative session because it's gonna impact people, it's gonna impact jobs, it's gonna impact support to students, it's gonna impact um, livelihoods in our community that are committed to providing public education to students. And, and we will make the best decisions based off of what we have to do. Um, but it should not give someone a pass to not fund what should be funded. Sorry, that's my soapbox today. Anyone else? As usual, thank you, Alex, for your due diligence in, in crunching the numbers. I'd be curious to see what that looks like, you know, as Mr. Bowman said, um, you know, what some of those numbers look like and what, how close we are to recapture and things of that nature. Um, I know we looked at that a, a while we're, back. I think we're far away from it. Yeah. But, um, our values are increasing, so we'll mm -hmm. go in and look at that. Okay. And seeing no further business before the board, we are adjourned at 652.